before we leave. Um, but today I want to talk about the topic at hand, prepping for deep sleep, how to shut it down, how to shut what down, how to shut down the arousal system. We have a few people here who've been complaining about sleep but, and not getting it, but not familiar with that curriculum. So I'm going to go high level and then we'll go granular and leave time for questions because overall thesis let's start with that the overall kind of science of sleep is that it's a function of arousal and if your system's arousal can go under the the line of sleep you will be asleep and if you have too much arousal and you know, and I'm not talking about sexual arousal, I'm talking about nervous system arousal, too much arousal, you will not be able to shut the windows down enough in order to get sleep. So what are the things that bring your arousal up? There's the kind of the conventional wisdom, which, you know, all these podcasts talk about is like, oh, you, you know, block the blue light, right? Yes. And right. Block the stressors and the media. Yes. And basic sleep hygiene requires somewhere between 68 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of the, the mean for where most humans, most humans, this might not be you, but most humans do best in terms of temperature regulation. Make it dark, right? If you're going to have lights, have red lights or amber lights, right? Or star lights. Because for hundreds of thousands of years, we actually slept under those. And those didn't wake us up. Harder to do nowadays. Starlink, I guess. But that's also a part of the the overall ecosystem. Is dark, cool, quiet. But it doesn't have to be like crickets quiet. Because guess what? Your ancestors slept with crickets. Your ancestors slept with jungle noises. So the question is, what sounds are calming and soothing and what sounds stimulate your arousal system. If I'm camping and I hear a bunch of scuffling outside my tent, I'm up thinking, oh my God, there's a bear. Good luck sleeping through that, right? So now most of you aren't camping tonight, but you're sleeping in a house that probably has a front door. And if you heard someone jostling your front door, you're thinking, oh my God, am I safe? right? If you heard helicopters going over your house and sirens going off, you're thinking, oh my God, am I safe? So all these sounds will trigger the arousal system if it is indeed a situation that requires you to say, get up, you're not safe. Okay. And again, sorry to belabor this for people that have already done the sleep program, but I'm gonna, is think about what sleep is. We're in a small tribe. We decide it's time to hunker down. I pick Kathleen and Faith to say, all right, you all are trustworthy. Hold the spears and be vigilant and keep guard while the rest of us sleep. So then I'm out in the wild trusting that I can lay this body down close my eyes and doze into an unconscious state and not be worried about a lion eating me, not be worried about a bum walking into my house and taking my stuff, not be worried about the sky is falling, right? So it is the ultimate vulnerable state, falling asleep. It is one of the most ultimate, powerful, almost paradoxical things we can do is to sleep. Because you don't do sleep. You fall asleep. You allow sleep. You let go for sleep to happen. So then the question are, the questions are, what are your personal preconditions as an animal that needs to feel safe to allow for sleep to happen? Now, if I'm thinking to myself, oh man, that Kathleen, last time she stood guard, she fell asleep. I can't trust her to protect me. Then I'm like, damn it, the night watch is not trustworthy. I'm sleeping with one eye open, right? Or every time we put them on guard, Kathleen and Faith are drinking whiskey, <laughs> right? Of course, that's what they do. So I don't feel safe. <laughs> and that is part of it. The other part of it is what am I bringing 
to the altar of sleep. And that's the hard part. I got my fears, I got my dramas, I got my traumas, I got my worries. I got my leftover to-do list, which grows longer than shorter by the end of the day if I'm not good at this. And then you kind of stumble through the day and you're like, oh man, it's dinner time. Oh man, look at that. Look, you know, time for bed. And, you know, my, my wife's really guilty of this is then she's like got 30 things that she like has undone that she, you know, is now suddenly trying to do in bed on a laptop or something. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Don't bring that into the bed, right? Because it's a blue light, it's stimulating, it's all of it, right? And so what are your habits and how are you decelerating into the evening? And let's just say, you know, I come into my office early. I come into the office early because after the dogs, I get a little bit of time before the kids stir. And I put in my password and this thing turns on, right? And as this thing turns on, I'm opening a tab, opening an email, opening another tab, opening a window. And so in my day, I start to open all of these kind of active areas where my brain is getting focused in and focused out of, and I'm working on stuff. But by the end of the day, if I'm not shutting down those tabs, if I'm not shutting down those windows, if I'm not shutting down all these open applications, and I'm sit staring at the desktop of my, my mind when the lights go out and all this stuff is still open and engaged and actively like in my face, how the hell am I going to sleep, right? And so it's something that Swami Kriyananda taught me 30 years ago that I think is incredibly applicable to all of my sleep students. It's called the ritual of the moon. And the ritual of the moon is very specifically you consciously turning the corner and saying, okay, enough. I want to be asleep 90 minutes, two hours, two and a half hours from now, depending on when you need to engage based on how activated and stimulated you are. I personally begin the ritual of the moon around 8 p.m. I like to be in bed by 9.30. And my wife complains that there's about 60 seconds between that and me snoring because I, I get long days. I'm out, right? Like I'm out. You know, my biggest complaint is I don't, I want to read in bed, but it's too late. So I got to read during the day. But at eight o'clock, I'm suddenly saying, okay, nothing stimulating, obviously alcohol being a big bad. Caffeine's an absolute no-no. Caffeine after two is an absolute red line. Caffeine after noon, if you're sensitive right? And you're already kind of having challenges with sleep. But what else is stimulating? Like I'm not paying bills. I'm not checking the news. You know what I mean? Like unless something tragic has happened, I don't want to hear about it till tomorrow morning. So I start shutting my windows down, preparing for a good night's sleep at 8 p.m. The real trick to this game is if you're having trouble sleeping, you begin prepping for a good night's sleep the moment you wake up for the following night, which means when are you getting your exercise? When are you burning your cortisol off? When are you eating in preparation for your calories to be used and not necessarily sitting on your digestive tract before you go to bed? When are you taking, if you can, high efficiency, high calorie carbohydrates for when your body needs them and is moving? And when are you taking more protein and fat? so that the digestive process is slower. A lot of my sleep patients over the years would wake up for, you know, obviously a variety of reasons. Blood sugar being a very big one. If your adrenals are tired, if you're wired and tired and pooped, what happens effectively is that your body, when it is in a stasis when it's trying to sleep, goes into kind of offline mode and says, you know what, leave Lucy alone. She's had a long day. And when the brain says, hey, I'm running out of sugar, doing all the really important, highly effective detoxification work the brain does at night, the brain says, I need more sugar. There's only two ways to get sugar, really. One is to wake you up and say, go eat it. And two is, let's go pull it out of reserves. And the reserves that the body uses at night are the glycogen reserves stored in the liver. And they're specifically a very quick, easy currency form of sugar that the brain could break down and utilize without waking up the boss. Now, when you have 
insulin issues going into your 30s, 40s, and 50s and beyond, living in the Western world and eating the stupid foods we've been exposed to. The inability to call on glycogen reserves starts to become very kind of stark because the way we tap into that alt currency is the use of our adrenals and cortisol. Hey, she's asleep. Let, let some cortisol go. Grab some out of the bank. It'll be all right. Tomorrow we'll make up for it. And tomorrow is more stressful. Tomorrow you're more beat up. Tomorrow you're more tired. The cortisol that is supposed to release is already a compromised system. And so there's two things that happen. One is there's not enough cortisol. The adrenals are saying, hey, I got it, brain, wake them up. So you just wake up and you're agitated. And you know, then you're like, well, I'm up, I should pee, right? All these other signals come up and then you kind of get stimulated and you go and you start ruminating. We talk about the different forms of insomnia or it's so stark that you wake up with your heart pounding because when cortisol is completely depleted, you go to adrenaline and then you wake up just like, holy crap, what was that? And people complain of nightmares and all that. But a lot of times it's just the system that's gone awry. And so preparing for a good night's sleep, in my experience, and my experience is a lot, I've, you know, I've been around sleep a long time now, is that managing your blood sugar throughout the day is the best long-term solution to solving sleep problems because blood sugar is kind of like the real big swinging indicator that will then drive cortisol, that would then drive insulin, that would then drive adrenaline and all the kind of stuff starts to go awry, but it starts with blood sugar. Once you manage your blood sugar, then it's like, okay, well, listen, your estrogen might be off, your progesterone might be off. There's a lot of things. But what happens is in the Western world in particular, because we're so damn solutions oriented, we'll take a short fix right? We'll, we'll put the little foam in your flat tire so you could finish the road trip and tell you, you should change this tire when you get there, but do you, right? And, and so what will happen is you go to a doctor and they're like, oh, well, look, look here, your progesterone's low. So they'll give you prescriptive hormones to make up for an underlying deficiency that came from blood sugar imbalance, cortisol, disharmony, and all these things. And so effectively people and I've seen hundreds of them are like, hey, yeah, I was taking melatonin. I was taking X. I was taking Y. When I first started, the progesterone was amazing and that didn't work anymore because the Band-Aid isn't solving the problem. The problem tends to be underlying stress, blood sugar insufficiency, not feeling safe. And if we don't take an active role in petting the baby, I'll explain what I mean in a second. We're constantly looking for some other magic formula we haven't heard of to solve this problem for us when we are the problem. What's the baby? Your body, and look, I've said this in many ways, and I will say it again. Your gut lining doesn't speak English. Your liver doesn't speak English. Your arousal system doesn't speak to you in French or English. It speaks to you in this odd sub language of mild anxiety, disease, insomnia, associative memories leading to uncomfortable feelings. And you're like, oh, I'm up, right? Why am I up? Why am I up? And so the real question I want you all to kind of reorient on, right? And I'm not going to suggest an answer because y'all have different history and, you know, different upbringing, right? Is what is when the baby is crying, does a good mother or father walk in there? alongside the crib and go, hey, shut up. Or do you say, what is it, baby? Pick it up, cuckoo it, kiss it, check its diaper, see if it's hungry, right? Why is the baby crying? And how can you lovingly pet the baby into comfort? All of the interventions on the sleep side that have kind of taken the media world or all the, you know, hey, shut up, varieties of silencing the baby. And then the baby gets cancer and then the baby pulls a knife on, it, on you, right? Like the baby is not going to be silenced because the baby is telling you something is wrong. You could silence the baby for a couple weeks here, a couple months there, but the baby is telling you something is wrong. What is it, baby? I love you. So what is it? Is it the dinner you ate? Is it the glass of wine you thought was okay? Is it your childhood trauma? that gets louder when the lights go down and the world gets silent? Is it 
the mold in your room? Is it the person you're sleeping next to who's mean to you or snores like a busted chainsaw? So many things that can bring up the arousal system. There are so many triggers. And so what I invite you to look at is when the lights go down, the world gets silent, and you are left without all the distractions with your own scary thoughts. What's left, right? And that's where the best healing can happen. That is where your body is talking to you, your mind is talking to you, your, the fallout of your day-to-day -day decisions is on top of you and you're trying to reconcile your day. So how do you reconcile your day? That's the ritual of the moon. Oh my God, I have four things I didn't finish and what am I gonna, okay. Make a to-do list for tomorrow. Move those four things there and tomorrow by hook or by crook, do them. Or stop giving yourself too many tasks. Are you unreasonably giving yourself more than you can take on? Or are you loitering at the water cooler and not doing the things that you say you're going to do? But honor your contracts with yourself so that you don't bring any more to-dos to bed. Bed is for sleep and making love. That's it. It's not for TV. It's not for bills. It's not for thinking through your to-dos for tomorrow. Don't bring that to the altar of sleep. So your homework for the ritual of the moon is to really think through what is it that you are bringing into the sacred space of sleep that needs to be left out of the bedroom? And what is it, and this isn't like, a, oh, aha, right? What is it that your body is trying to tell you that you need to hear? Nine times out of 10, not 10 times, but nine times out of 10, it has a lot to do with the inputs, right? Something you ate, something you drank, right? Something you rubbed on your skin, something you brought into your bedroom that smells or lets off electricity, right? So look at the external inputs that make you feel unsafe and then turn inward because we all have internal inputs. Mom said this, dad did that, my sister's an asshole, right? Like we all have stuff. So, but that stuff gets louder when our alarm system is already being rung. If something wakes me up in the middle of the night, then I'm thinking about the problem I had with my stupid email server or whatever it is, right? The problem du jour. But if I can bring down the number of things that stimulate me and I can stack more and more calming rituals and more soothing self-love into my evening, that will overwhelm the amount of signals sending me into panic, disarray, disharmonious sleep. Does that make sense? It is an effort that you make every single day to prepare yourself for the beautiful, beautiful ritual called sleep. It's not inevitable that you're going to fall asleep. I mean, it is. You will fall asleep because you're damn exhausted and you need it. But if you make space for sleep and you ask what sleep needs of you, It'll start to change your lifestyle for the better, and it'll start to reorient the way you frame your days so that they're less assembled around hectic, crazy, stupid shit and more around a harvest and a planting season, right? The more around natural cycles that come up and come down naturally. So, all right, I got to jump to another room. Sleep. We'll see you.